what I'll do is uh, I'll just start off with one or two questions um, of my own, because of course, you know, I have my own perhaps um, interpretation, if there is, you know, any sort of multiple interpretations of the film, but I'm sure you all also have your own questions. Um, I mean, I myself, for those of you who don't know me so well, um, I'm um, a teacher in communications and new media, and I teach mostly sort of humanistic kind of topics, so things to do with media and, and representation, the interpretation of text and visuals in general. So um, from my perspective, from my academic background, right, this is an extremely interesting film, and one could very easily write a very interesting analysis of the film as such, and the way it, it performs itself as a documentary, but also the actual footage that, that is incorporated in there. And uh, I think what for me is particularly interesting in that sense of, um, of the film is that it in a sense works on two levels, I think. Um, to what extent some of that is intentional or not that, that we can go into, but I think uh, on the one hand, the film, the film has a very interesting sort of, if you will, surface narrative of trying to uncover some alternative stories or histories or some alternative facts. So, um, and it, it, it does that very nicely, showing fragments that uh, I've lived in Singapore for ten years, but definitely showing fragments of things that I had never heard about and you know perspectives that I hadn't heard about before. So there are all these allusions to what it means to make a documentary and there, there's these par parallels being drawn inside the film to, for instance, archaeology, obviously, like, you know, from beginning, the beginning and the end is couched in this archaeological narrative, sort of likening the making of a documentary like this to uncovering or digging up certain facts or artifacts, uh, digging up a different kind of truth or a different kind of interpretation of the, of the past. Um, Archaeology, but also um, Ivan Polunin's attempts are very interesting. The way, you know, the, at the same time, how he's narrating why he shoots shot certain footage, but also the way in which he seems so eager to preserve parts of that past, or to preserve even what is in his brain, like unload his his brain into the machine. He says at some point, yeah. kind of difficult or frustrating, perhaps sometimes, but also interesting attempts to uncover an alternative past and to uncover certain facts and to make sense of that. But we all sort of left at the end, and that's why I like the end footage of the archaeologists very much. We have like a box with bits and pieces of fragments. And now what? Well, what are we to make of this? How can we sort of understand this differently than sort of the dominant story that we, that we, that we hear about Singapore and sort of the building of the nation or what have you? But did you have any kind of sense of, for yourself, that by showing certain fragments, if you will, that for you it adds up to a critique of dominant history of Singapore or how society functions today? Or I, I think that's a subtext. I wanted to give the sense that um, what we know today lives, could possibly live and die by us, like we're the last person to know this particular fact that would in a way change the whole of history. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned the stash of photographs because for him, as far as he was concerned, if he group of his friends, that stash of photographs has never been seen publicly before. Mm -hmm. And as far as he's concerned, it would change the whole writing of all the textbooks. Mm -hmm. So for each of the different people that I have featured, they were, in a way, the last man standing for that their particular way of seeing. Mm -hmm. So even uh, the Japanese reporter, um, she will bore witness, so she almost feels duty bound. There's no other way but to write the article. But of course, she has to couch the article that would be palatable to to a Japanese audience. And and you sort of see the burden of this knowledge for all these different people. You know, Ivan Polonin is struggling <laughs> to 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 remember. Because as far as he's concerned, he's the last person that saw the image. <laughs> and if he doesn't remember, it's all going to be, you know, YouTube uh, detritus floating around. Um, so I was very lucky to actually find or stumble upon all these different people who, are, who in their own way feel almost duty bound to speak and publish in one way or other. Even Marjorie Doggett, um, she was really just a housewife, really. But as far as she was concerned, if she didn't go out with her camera and tripod to actually hunt down these um, buildings that were demolished 
this is in the 50s, my you, so actually the way history doesn't, doesn't stop. Um, you would not know what RI used to look, look like. You know, YMCA, I don't know how many of you actually remember these buildings. Uh, YMCA building at, at um, Ras Pasa, you know, the old CHIJ in the town of in Victoria Street, mm -hmm. and some of the go downs in, in, in Mohammed Sultan Road. But it leads to the larger question that if these are all the gaps that vest within these singular <laughs> personalities, then what other gaps mm -hmm. are there left? Mm -hmm. And what does that behove us, you know, the, this generation of Singaporeans to, to do, to actually work to preserve? Mm -hmm. um, that's why the, the archaeologists were, in a way, inseparable from this documentary, because they, they, they personify the whole process, you actually back-breaking work of remembering, mm -hmm. of finding, of, of recording. And as you kind of like scramble through these bits and pieces, you actually have no idea of the significance. Mm -hmm. and, and the amount of effort it takes to sort of make sense of a yo kyap bottle, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> much less to even find it, you know, uh, uh, what, what, what does that actually mean for us? It needed to feature that many number of people in that fragmented a way to make its point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and some stories are more complete than others. Um, and I suppose that is the nature of, of, of the, the continual process of, of coming to terms with uh, one's own story, I suppose. Right. I mean, there are slightly more arched sections, for example, you know, the bit where suddenly no image. Uh, you, you've seen no image. Um, that was my way of let, putting you in the situation of trying to imagine what those images that he was describing uh, is lost. Mm -hmm. And all you left is his voice <laughs> describing what you cannot see. And, 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 and that sometimes happens, all you left are soundtracks mm -hmm. because they survive a little bit longer than they dictate. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you know. The 16 mm might have been set on fire. That's so why it was quite interesting that I, all I saw a little piddly fire extinguisher in his yeah. <laughs> basement. The film is an extremely flammable. Yeah, um, that was really yeah mm -hmm. you know, and it lets off all kinds of fumes that are extremely combustible. Mm -hmm. And all you have sort of holding back the flames is this little kitchen fire extinguisher. <laughs> Yeah, and you were talking about these people feeling it's almost a sense of duty or mm. you know, some kind of urge mm -hmm. to somehow have their memories recorded or whatever. It's somehow, you know, to preserve or bring to life to some extent, yeah. in a palatable way for some of them, mm -hmm. a, a different kind of story. Mm -hmm. Do you, by making this documentary, do you have that sense of urgency yourself? I think this is also partly autobiographical in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Ivan Pallone talks about his work and why he's doing what he does, it could very well be me. Right. Yeah. Uh, like, why, do, why does one make film? So these are some of the questions that, that um, I ask myself. Like, why am I breaking my back trying to do what I do? Yeah. And I suppose it's a way of finding inspiration in the works of other people. <laughs> Not necessarily filmmakers themselves, but it could be you know, archaeologists or journalists or historians. Doing, doing their own um, area of studies. Mm -hmm. I know you're earlier, much earlier, that moving house, for instance, is a very sort of, well, sort of edited, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say glitzy, right, but much more um, coherent kind of narrative. Whereas this one is much more fragmented, like you say, with gaps. There's no voiceover mm -hmm. by you or by any, any narrator. So, what those also kind of conscious choices? In a way, or did you feel like you wouldn't want to impose your own narrative per se, even though you are the one who is making the film? I don't know. It is a struggle, so make it re make it really very really easy and palatable. But in a way, I'm in a way going for depth. I'm hoping that all your experiences would be a, be a bit more memorable for having seen it the way it is, and that you know, on a balance, this is a, a slightly uh, more enduring experience. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because this was made in 2007 and I'm, I'm suddenly realizing that the pace of editing is very, very 
he's small. <laughs> um, I've seen small. Yeah, but you know, for for for, and and I'm just wondering if you actually see it from a really small handphone or uh, an iPad, it will not sustain that experience. Maybe there is a case for for making films for. Uh, for different devices at different pace so that they reach different audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something about the, the technology the, through which you see the film obviously as well. And it, it, it fits, it fits both ways, attention yeah. spans, technology. Yeah. I mean this is the way that you're watching a film right now which is on a big screen with sharing it with other people is, is, is going to be um, a really exclusive experience you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that level of engagement would no longer be a common one um, in time to come? Mm -hmm. No, people just individually see it on separate screens. On really small separate oh, screens. Yeah. 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 So memory also is built on by virtue of suppressing other aspects mm. of, of that memory or forgetting mm. certain aspects. And um, again, in, in the film, it seems to suggest that film equally does that. It suggests to me, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a sense, that the technique or technology of preservation is very visual, it's also quite auditory, but you know, otherwise, of course, images, one doesn't touch it, it is not in the same context, or experienced in the same context um, as, you know, for instance, the archaeologist who goes to the site and he asks, why are you taking these bits out of the soil and putting them somewhere else, why not just leave them there? Yeah. And so filmmaking seems to have a similar, similar kind of technique, I suppose. One shoots images and they will be screened somewhere else. Yes. And it's no longer in a particular context. So in a certain sense, there must have been, I mean, apart from um, this kind of unconscious or unintentional kind of selection and forgetting that the technology already does for you, have there also been very clearly certain parts that you edited out? of this film because you said, okay, there are these few people, this is kind of footage. At some point, Poluna says, well, you've been for two and a half hours here filming and you only get like one sentence out of me. So mm. how is the choice made to show, even if it's slowly in, 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 in the end, parts? everything had to be coherent. So anything that was extraneous had to be taken out. <laughs> but well, how did you decide what is extraneous? To, uh, to I mean, in, if in relation to what is it? In relation to everyone had to have something that they wanted to save very, very dearly. Yeah, that you can see them physically mm -hmm. trying to remember, preserve, mm -hmm. uh, spread news about mm -hmm. a certain point of view. Mm -hmm. So I just followed their journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So part of, of your intention was also to show the struggle. Yes, to remember. yes, entirely. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean the struggle is central yeah. right. to this whole thing. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I do agree with Dr. Ingrid that it's very self-reflexive and you it seems rather there's a very deliberate rawness in the experience of the film that uh, somehow when I when I watch it and I was wondering was there any reason why you choose to take out the identification of the characters without um, identifying them in the film at all until towards the credit. And this, this was a decision we had to struggle with, whether to actually... I mean, let's say you put a name, Marjorie Topley. She's, she's the anthropologist who, speak, who was speaking Cantonese to the Amma Jazz, mm -hmm. um, whom Ivan Kulodin was following. It's different from Marjorie Doggett, who was the photographer. I mean, I think at that point everyone was called Marjorie or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and then I'm in the Far East. <laughs> I was just wondering if like, we put the name there, say, Mr. ABC, mm -hmm. whether you needed to put a uh, subtitle which said teacher or doctor mm -hmm. or not. And in the end I just felt that that was extremely troublesome to have to give their title. Because the name like Dr. Ivan Perlonen, Associate Professor, Department of Tropical Medicine, hardly gives you an inclination, which is, was his official title at that time, hardly gives you an, an idea of what he was doing, which was a lot larger than that. Similarly, you know, Marjorie, Doggett, housewife, sometimes photographer. <laughs> it, it didn't add very much to, to that experience. 
as well. When one watches this documentary, you suddenly realize that in other documentaries you're always given the names and the whatever title or you know anthropologist or whatever. And so suddenly it strikes one as, oh, you know, in the absence of this information, how do I actually make sense of yeah. what is presented? Because today? actually the name actually only makes sense when you give their their roles. Because mm -hmm. the names themselves um, are mainly placeholders. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it was it was a struggle trying to find a role for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes the text more open in a sense, though, I think. Yeah. Why, why do you choose to use an uh, unconventional way of document, uh, documenting what you wish to put across? I think for me, the camera is just a way of meeting people. So the people that I'm interested in, I just go up to them and talk to them, and I happen to have a camera. So to actually you know, start writing a script and cast actor, I don't find that process rewarding at all. So it's, it's, uh, it's for me like a pen that you just sit down and you write something. Mm -hmm. So the camera is for me a, a, a means to uh, be really a busy body. <laughs> In this sense you had say four or five different stories. Uh, how did you pick these stories? Did you actually go and meet up with more number of people? How do you decide whom to go meet up with? Uh, it's a very long, tortured process. <laughs> because initially this documentary started out as a, being a documentary about spaces. It had nothing to do with its final form, but I found myself attracted to the work of the archaeologist. So I kind of like followed him around. And when I found that he was doing what he was doing, and I thought, Two years before that, I had met Marjorie Doggett and had filmed that footage for no reason other than the fact to meet her. So this Marjorie Doggett footage was shot way before this documentary was even conceived. So I mean, my process is to just collect a lot of stuff and then at some point try to find a way to join all the dots together. So it is, uh, you can imagine, extremely organic and also time consuming. So it's not like a, a grant proposal where you, you come up with a really neat grant proposal and you, you satisfy all the milestones. It's a lot uh, Yeah, because I was wondering whether ICS, for instance, had some requests or requirements mm. in relation to... No, I mean, they had received an application about Singapore spaces, because that was after I'd done Singapore Gaga. Yeah. So after I finished the film, I showed them the final product. I said, it's really very different from your... <laughs> from the money that you have given me funding for. Uh, do you want to take a look and see if you want your you money back? You want your money back? <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, they, they didn't. They, they were very happy to have their name attached to this project. Are there any people you left out that you have footage of? I have 40 hours of footage. Oh my goodness. So it must be a lot, so right? Anyone <laughs> so that has made it to, to the film. Sounds like a humanities dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> Cut like 90% out. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is I made another film five years later of the leftover footage called Snow City, which has totally nothing to do with this film. Let's go and watch that. <laughs> <laughs> also, what as academics, we choose to write up and what we choose to leave out, mm -hmm. even if we sometimes pretend to let other people speak, mm. right? Like our text or maybe also visuals can be sometimes sort of um, camouflaging the way we actually very much select mm. what we show and what we don't show. Mm. You know? So even if we, we don't intentionally do that, there is always a sense in which the author is always present mm. in the text. Even if like, it's, the text is one long quotation by whoever you have interviewed. Yeah. So I think, and, and this is always for me as an academic, is. Um, um, concerns or well, troubles me very much. Maybe. And one can only in the end, I suppose for me, be honest about what is the stamp when in the end leaves mm. on the text or the final product. It's, it's an interesting in that sense to hear that, okay, well, out of 40 hours that you have, there's one hour that actually made it into the film. So, you know, and <laughs> in the end, there's the, the, the Chinese, I'm sorry, I forget his name, is saying what Hegel says, when something does not have a reason to exist, it doesn't exist. Doesn't it doesn't exist. exist. <laughs> but what a curious thing to say in a way, in, I mean, in the context of this film. Yeah. Right? Is it, 
I'm wondering what it's what can be said. Yeah. Uh, defeat almost. Yeah. Yeah. It, I guess it's uh, rationalizing why his story may also exist. And that is also a reasonable story. Yeah. So just because you were filming also the frustration, right, of something like put in there, how oh, to preserve this, I cannot, you know, I cannot die without this stuff somehow making it to, a, to another audience and we're living on. And the frustration of the machinery, that the bloody microphone doesn't work now. How, how do I narrate what I want to narrate? Yes. And so there's sort of a, almost a bit of a fight with the machine, yes. in a sense as well. Mm. Yeah. So again, it's, it's like, you feel that same sense of frustration also, yeah. like even you know when you edit out 39 hours, do you feel a sense of regret or um, worry about what you had in those hours? It was such a painful process trying to put this together. I mean, which all explains your nicely put deliberate raw rawness. Actually, it's totally no choice rawness. <laughs> <laughs> it's just trying to squeeze and make sense of my own thinking. Hi, uh, I'm Chai Chong. Uh, I'm a Singaporean. Uh, I was just wondering. We should all start Q and A's with that. Declaration <laughs> from now on. <laughs> yeah, I was just uh, wondering uh, whether um, there are things that you hope Singaporean audiences, in particular, would uh, take away from this uh, film. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, this generation of Singaporeans you all um, are very uh, obsessed with taking photographs. Should we all be going out now to capture more footages? just so that history for the next generation uh, will be preserved. Yeah, Actually, I, I have started doing that myself. Uh, I, I took a video footage of lift upgrading, um, uh, thinking that one day it might be commercially valuable. This <laughs> <laughs> um, was interesting, you know, Ivan Poulin has got like 30 hours of very important footage about Singapore. Mm. Right? Because he's a naturalist and he's a medical person, but his interests veer more into our natural natural history heritage. So there's less of no lift upgrading or stuff like that. Um, but he said that, you know, it turns out like 50 years later, the most valuable footage of his, the most that most people wanted to see, is footage in which he had very summarily taken. It was just a Chinatown market scene what the lady was selling, how the fish was being sold, the haggling process, and of course, what you see here, you see this police car driving by, and then you see all the illegal hawkers running away, <laughs> right? Then he, he said that he just happened to be there and just took a little bit of the footage. So of all the 30 hours that he had, that five minute market segment was the most lauded. So, I mean, it, it, what's interesting for me is that, you know, can we put place bets now like, what kind of footage would we take that 50 years from now, our great-grandchildren our grandchildren would actually stare and stare and stare at it? I, I've actually sat through all this footage in National Archives, and I'm thinking, boring, 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 boring. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, that, that's quite... It, it was actually the material culture that I found interesting. For example, what the fishermen ate for lunch. For me, you know, it's... it's white rice, sambal you pounded yourself, <laughs> fresh sambal and, 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 and a fish that you probably just caught, which you steamed. I mean, to answer your question, Mohan, I mean, there's one point I forget to mention. I mean, sometimes when I sort of show this video, and it's gone around different places to be screened in Singapore, sometimes I'm asked, um, why do you only have, why do you highlight the colonials? Why are there no uh, people other races, mm -hmm. for instance, and in, in the same way you're asking me what have I deliberately left out and it's more, I don't uh, cut color to that question, is why aren't other people represented as well? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't have a smart answer but the fact that my criteria wasn't, my criteria were my, were my own interests uh, and the second one was that it had to hold together as a film. So I wasn't going to put something in that didn't belong just because, you know, it would serve the rainbow that Singapore is or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. If one seeks to narrate sort of alternative stories, 
to what extent can then can one actually manage to mm. make it a really alternative story? With the materials that are there and the people that have survived, what can one do, I suppose? To what extent can one go? Right. Yeah. Uh, there's always limitations. And everyone's dying, right? Right, <laughs> not a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think Logan passed away last year and Marjorie Dog the year before. Yes, interestingly, it doesn't, at least for me as an audience, but maybe it's also because I'm not Singaporean or mm. from this region, it does not add up to one narrative. No. Yeah, I don't know how that is for other people in the audience. And it's not meant to be, it's not enough to go on. And I think that was yeah. one of the frustrations of some of the audience as well, because it's like, why don't you make a whole documentary about the Chinese student movement? Right. Then I'm like looking at them, I'm like, you want to find out? <laughs> you find I do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just thought it was a misplaced indignance, I thought. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I can see though that some people would want something like that yeah. out of a document. No, but why, why march up to the, the director to demand, you see, without offering something yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, that's very common to academics too. Uh, why did you do blue and not red? Yeah. Why not purple? Uh, yeah. When the film is shown in Singapore, I found that people let on to very specific personalities. Mm -hmm. When it's actually shown abroad, um, they catch on to the theme a lot quicker because mm -hmm. they're not bogged down by details almost. Mm -hmm. Or identification. Identification. Yeah. And it almost feels as if uh, details, you miss the forest or the trees. What is that sense of duty or responsibility to record, uh, to preserve, right. or to show? But this is actually very interesting. It struck me the extent to which Polonian was so, I wouldn't say obsessed, but so hell bent on. And same with Han San Yuan as well. I mean, he felt yes. really duty bound to keep talking, even yeah. to uh, really um, people who have no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. But for him, it seems there's a very clear politics behind it. Yes. Right? They want, I want this alternative story to, to be heard. They are not violent, what have you. But for Lunen, it's more, it seems like it's almost it's something in itself. itself. It's the same, same germ of, it's probably from the same root. Mm -hmm. I mean, the intentions are different, but the yeah. desire to, yeah. Like you said, at least that's what I feel. Well, there's a very interesting term in, in continental philosophy. It's called archive fever. So it okay. suggests that especially Western culture suffers from archive fever. So wanting to preserve, wanting to record, hence museums, hence ethnographers, hence filmmaking to try to somehow. And of course, this kind of idea of preserving or creating archives like museums or colonial museums are always also somehow tied to politics and power mm. in terms of Western, former Western empire. So, you know, in that sense, I suppose it's right that maybe you know the Chinese fellow has a more clear sort of political statement to make. But certainly, in the case of Polunen, there is a certain colonial, post-colonial politics going on as well. Although he may not be conscious of that, but it seems like it becomes to him sort of a personal thing. Like I want to be immortal, but you know, it seems to me that it's more than than just that. Yeah. Uh, and so sort of, since the film is so self-reflexive, and you as a documentary filmmaker are sort of engaging with the, making a documentary and the desire, the desire to archive. You know, that, that's why I'm so interested in your, your sense of responsibility or duty or some kind of sense of what was the kind of main point that you were from. I suppose I wanted to show how soft our ground is. Okay. Uh, um, I mean, the facts just seem to be constructed at really, really personal, on the whims of personal desires. Uh -huh. You know, if he decided not to take that photograph or show that photograph uh -huh. or remember that particular scene in a certain way, then that one connection to the fact is broken. Mm -hmm. So it's like it, it's like film is also a prosthesis to one's memory. Yes, correct. If 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 that if that connection is as feeble as it's shown to be, I mean, like, you know, the Japanese journalists had to go through a really crap translator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so already it's so rickety, right? The whole process. Mm -hmm. So my idea is to 
actually showcase how rickety <laughs> mm -hmm. everything is. <laughs> how rickety our understanding of yeah, so oh, the stories because it's it is it's yeah. so tenuous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. tenuous. Yeah. Uh, was there any point that you felt that you might want to consider inserting yourself into the, the this documentary? I don't think it's necessary. More than it already is. Yeah. Why are you asking? Uh, what, it's it's what kind of like mean? to tie into the idea of self reflexivity because I mean this the, the film being about documentary making. So uh, by capturing all these documentaries, maybe it also shows your role as a documentary yourself. So that's why maybe the idea of self-reflexivity might, you might, ha uh, I don't know, was wondering whether you would consider inserting yourself and yeah, visually. I think that technique is overused. Mm. And I don't think it's necessary. Because it's there even though it, you, know, you don't see me walking with a camera or something like that. You don't need that anymore. And I think it's overused with a lot of the reality TV type um, films, TV shows that we have seen. Because every edit you make is already a decision <coughs> that is, has a personality behind that. I'll show you. Say it, so Need some cool friends of mine. You know, um. <laughs> but I also think that that would be a problem because I mean, making it more accessible also giving it's giving them the the in a sense a crutch to understand it. Because I mean, there's a film for every kind of audience. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just that this particular film became what it is um, because the material itself couldn't be bent any other way. Mm -hmm. I felt at the time. And I didn't feel like angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that was the main thing. Yeah. I didn't feel like um, making it then what it demanded to be. Yeah. Again, I'm referring to my academic experience as an academic. Like one writes, one can write very incisive, complicated text, but one knows the audience will be quite small. Well, yeah, but that one demands a lot from the audience. Mm. And so. I think writing is a bit different because you can say very, very complex things with very simple language as well. Mm -hmm. sure. Certainly, well, one can do that in academia as well. Yeah. Um, but more in the sense of that this particular documentary, for instance, demands a lot from its audience, right? Sort of making sense, or sort of not easy, very easy to latch onto one particular oh, maybe I should put it that, that way, to say what needed to be said with what I had, uh, this was the best I could come up with. Okay. And maybe with more money, more time, better camera work. <laughs> Because a lot of it was shot by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been a little bit less raw, for instance. Mm -hmm. After what you said about you have a lot of footage to sort out, but you still chose to use certain shots to yeah. link up. I mean, you know that the DHL balloon is no longer there, right? Yeah, it's no longer there. That rising shot. And I really love shots where you're elevated and you actually see in real time the 3D effect of... It's kind of like Google Earth. <laughs> where you can actually just see but from, from a hot air balloon. Um, so to capture that particular perspective was quite important to me. Yeah. Because it's all about um, being there at an instant, in the blink of an eye, that perspective would no longer be there. Because of course a hot air balloon doesn't exist. And if, even if the building were to be in its state, you would never get to see the real time transformation of that landscape before you. Because, I mean, everyone's talking about Singapore, this is the first time we've actually seen, mm -hmm. say, the city area, right? Because mm -hmm. up until that point, you had only seen, um, you know, life in the cave or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is what it is today. Today. Yeah. Yeah, at the 50th minute of the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's now yesterday, right? Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> slightly different. <laughs> Singapore changing so quickly. Yeah. I, I invited... Um,
Kuo and Dr. Golden to the premier. Um, I mean, after that, they still kind of spoke with me, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're not angry. <laughs> we're too angry. <laughs> so they felt that they were fairly represented, even though their names and their titles weren't featured. Oh, actually, there's one part where Dr. Polonin had, in the first edition, the first edition, Dr. Polonin had said something that he didn't want to leave it with the National Archives because he didn't think very much of them. I had to take that line out. <laughs> there was one part during the film that you um, cut off the sound of the translator, the Chinese translator who was translating for the Japanese um, uh, writer. Is there something specific that you're trying to convey? Because there was no sound, you could only see them um, speaking or see the Chinese translator speaking. I suppose that was just a way to sort of lift you out of the film for a while to just sort of see, see a scene for what it is without getting bogged down with details. Mm -hmm. Because in a way what she said, you already know anyway. So quick, would it be fair to say that after such a documentary, you would make subsequent documentaries differently? Does it, like the making of the documentary, did it influence you as a filmmaker? Um, if this was a particularly hard to do, uh, it yeah. took a really long time for it to come together. Uh, so no more of that <laughs> for now. Unfortunately, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I learned my lesson. <laughs> Who would you list as your key influences for filmmakers? I actually don't have any. Because I think most of my key influences are not really film directors themselves. Possibly. Um, artists, thinkers, mm. writers, maybe. Singaporean? Not necessarily. Mm. Here you go. <laughs> 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 I haven't made a dent in that yet. <laughs> yeah. <No need. laughs> I'll read the For Beginners. <laughs> or Dummies Guide to Hegel. <laughs> yeah, try, try to read him to understand what Hansan was saying. <laughs> yeah, <what's laughs> so, so. <laughs> yeah. If there is a social change thematic that you see that has to go into every film that you make, does it have to be explicit or is it implicit? But take Invisible City for an example. Uh, does it work towards social change, explicitly or implicitly? I think it's one step removed from that because I don't necessarily feel that uh, film has got such a strong <laughs> uh, effect on people. Mm. Actually, I think very little has. I mean, it's not as if um, you're going to go out to interview your grandfather about his life story immediately. Mm. Um, I'm hoping that uh, it would just help you think a little bit through our history. Mm. And not to take everything for at face value. Just because, as I mentioned, you know, everything is just on the weakest of... <coughs> everything stands, you know, not necessarily because it needs to stand, but just because, you know, there's enough might behind it to stand. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful message. Yeah. Very powerful message that you're trying to send to the, this generation. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 But I mean, to, for, for it to effect change, it, I, I, that's why I say it's one step removed. Mm -hmm. as, as humanities academics, we would say, change to the imagination is the most important <laughs> for how change yes. one can yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think you know, the film. Works so this is real well life examples sense. or Singaporean examples of, of that. Yeah. yeah. Rather than mm -hmm. taking examples from some culture that doesn't belong to you, that has no uh, local relevance. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we have our own. <coughs> contested histories. Yeah. What you said adds to the ongoing dialogue uh, uh, that's in Singapore today that you know we want, uh, we hope that everybody's going to be uh, questioning as opposed to just uh, accepting like what's in the history books. Yeah, because so what you said, uh, you know, reinforced. I suppose, yeah, I mean, but at the same time, not being such a defeatist rebel rouser without understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, it depends. It's Rebel Rouser. No, I don't. I think it's a yeah, faithful mystic Rebel Rouser, of which I see so much of, which really troubles me as well. Oh, okay. You're wrong, you're wrong, and you're wrong, and, oh. and um, without actually being a bit more considered in, in the antagonism almost to, to the things. Okay, on that note, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Pimpin, <laughs> for helping us understand this film a bit more closely. Were you doing the Q&A for Sand Castle as well? No, I wasn't. No, no, no. I did the Q&A for Sand Castle. Why? No, I'm just because wondering whether there was a... Um, and you see an echo? For sure, you know, you see an echo in terms of this idea of raising questions, uh, struggling with information, you know, yes. not taking everything for granted, looking at what are the frames through which we process information. I must now go and see that film as well. You said I'm one day. I'm starring it, so you have to see it. <laughs> I can't be <laughs> that definitely must be. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much, Jim, okay. and thanks everybody.